Thank you everyone for joining us today for our mining seminar series um, here at Mines. Um, great to see so many people attending. Um, we have a pretty cool talk here. I haven't heard it before. I think uh, Chris and Henry have been giving a similar talk at SME before, but I think it's going to be super interesting and I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Muthu just uh, put some of the details um, how you can reach us, how you can find more uh, out more about our seminar in the chat box. So if you want to check that out, it also has a link to the YouTube channel. In case you missed the seminar, you can uh, view recordings there. Um, and then we also have a brand new page uh, on on our Mines Mining uh, site that has all the details uh, on it. So whenever you feel like you need some more information about the seminar, it's, just go there. Um, one last side note, I think next week we're going to have uh, get a, a cool introduction into a new um, degree we're offering here at Mines um, in space mining. You got to remind me move with space mining. That's the official title. Yep. It's a minor in space mining and also specifically offered as an interdisciplinary program for undergraduate students as well. So it's one of the first kind. So uh, join us next week. We're going to have a, a brief blurb detailing what the program is going to look like and the professors will talk more of the specifics about it. It's an exciting thing that's going around. Yeah, so that's that's uh, next week, a little bit on that. We're, it's kind of a broad spectrum we're covering it today. I think it's all going to be underground. Next week, it's going to be flying underground. So we're going to be talking about uh, drones and the use, usage of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles underground um, and then also space mining, so a completely different perspective. Um, yeah, with that, um, I don't want to have our uh, speakers waiting anymore. Uh, I'm just going to shortly introduce both of them. Um, we have Chris Johnson with us today. He's the president and principal mining engineer of Underground Mining Solutions LLC. He graduated from Western Australia School of Mines in 1995. He's a registered PE in the state of Nevada and a registered member of the SME. Additionally, he's a fellow of the chartered professional member of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. Chris is a mining engineer with a wide and various range of operating management and, ooh, and now the polls are in my way. <laughs> management and technical experiences in excess of 25 years, predominantly in underground mining. More recently, Chris has also applied his experience to cost modeling and mining project due diligence. Um, Henry Wong is currently um, a mining engineer working for Newman Corporation here in their Denver office. He earned his PhD in mining engineering from Penn State University in 2007. In addition, um, to two master's degrees and a bachelor. Um, he is a registered PE in the state of Nevada as well, and uh, after working four years in Elko. Henry has a wide range of expertise, including rock mechanics, numerical modeling, mine planning, and schedule optimization. Um, just on a personal note, I'm super happy to have both of them here. I think I met uh, both of you guys in 2016, the first time I was interning with Newmont, and now it's, it's kind of sweet to have you back and uh, um, yeah, just from a personal standpoint, thank you so much for, for making time and uh, giving that talk and we all really appreciate that. And with that, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Chris and Henry. Um, and we probably need to give you permission to share the screen, right? Or you should have that actually. seeing the yeah there we go we're getting there yep perfect all right so, so as, as lucas kindly introduced um their work with lucas a number of years ago uh, when he was interning with new so this talk that i'm giving this was actually presented by myself and henry at the sme earlier last year uh, that was the last time i was on an airplane i think around february Obviously, things have been different since then. But anyway, we gave this talk. Um, we, we only had a, about 17 minutes, so we did have to go through a lot of stuff pretty quick. So today, I'm going to take my time a little bit more and then go through a little bit more detail if I can, because you know a lot, a lot of ground to cover. Um, please feel free to, to put whatever as you go through, put any questions in the chat or whatnot, and we should have enough time at the end to go through any questions or, or whatnot. So what, what I'm going to be doing here today is 
is, uh, well, hang on, I'll just go back a step. So we've got, uh, yeah, so the topic is strategic optimization of the underground mine plan. So it's really focused on underground, underground mining, how you optimize an underground mine plan. So the agenda, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to, well, Henry and myself, we are going to propose an underground mine optimization strategy. And through this, we're going to discuss the required steps, tools, and techniques to execute that strategy. So why do we do this? Why do we want to you know, optimize a mine plan apart from the, the obvious? The primary goal, the reason we're in mining really is to make money. You know, we're not here to mine the most tons or the most ounces, we're here to make money. And so part of that is optimizing your mine plan to ensure that you are maximizing value, getting the most money. Uh, the high grade deposits, you know, the one ounce deposits are exceedingly rare. Uh, you don't see them anymore. So, you know, those high grade deposits or an, in the current case, a rising gold price hides a lot of mistakes. But as the gold price, you know, will come back or normalize, you know, you should, you know, those mistakes are going to be harder to hide. So you do need to be pretty strict with your operations. And we now have powerful tools. So historically, you go back 30, 40 years ago, you know, we had no, you know, we didn't have spreadsheets. We didn't have Deswick or other mine planning software. So we've now got software and tools that allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. Previously, a lot of the times, I think it was just our technology, the, the equipment that we had prevented us from doing things you can do today. And finally, you know, the return on investment can be tremendous. You know, uneconomic un mines could become economic. Marginal mines could become lucrative. It's not easy. Um, it's not an easy process, but relative to the mining construction costs and exploration drilling, it's a small investment with potential massive returns. And generally, you know, the more complicated the mine, the greater the potential reward. You know, it's pretty easy to optimize a very simple mine, but if it's complicated, uh, you know, you, you really need to use some tools and uh, techniques to kind of get full value out of the operation. So a little introduction to, to underground that those that are not overly familiar, you know, it is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts in an underground mine. We don't have any plug or play tools that optimize a mine similar to Whittle, not saying that that does a perfect job, but certainly, you know, it, it helps a lot in the open pit space. There's nothing really quite like that in underground, uh, but there are powerful tools that can assist us in achieving the strategy optimizing. And we're gonna go through those tools that help optimize each of the tactical steps. So here is a flow diagram that shows the steps of zeroing in on the optimum value of a, pro of a mine or a project. And it's, it's a feedback loop system. You know, there is no kind of enter some numbers here and here is the answer. You know, it's a bit of, you have to run a few things and run it several times to try to learn and try to zero in on what the optimum value or the optimum mine is. So in this, uh, notice those that have got the highlighted yellow around them. There's sort of some of the more important steps that I'm going to spend a bit more time discussing, you know, particularly around, you know, costs and your schedule optimization, the hill of value, particularly cutoff value or cutoff grade. And there's some of the more important ones we're going to be discussing. So here you can see it's a feedback loop. So as you get information, the information will go to different steps and it's going to feed back to hill of value to cutoff grade or cutoff value, which then puts you back at the beginning of design and can kind of go around and around till you start narrowing in on what the up, up, you know, optimal value is, which would be the Hiller value, which Henry will talk in detail later on in a real life example. So again, you know, when you look at an underground mine, there's a lot of moving parts and it's not always clear, even for the most experienced of us, we don't really know what the impact of a change is going to be. Uh, you know, changing one factor can have a flow and effect that may not be well understood, thus, changes often need to be implemented through all stages to really understand what their full effect is. You know, take, take example, a simple case of lowering the gold price. We're gonna lower the gold price of a gold mine. Well, if you do that, then you have to revisit the break-even grades. And if you revisit the break-even grades, that might means you have to revisit the mineable scopes, the mineable shapes. And then from there, you have to revisit the supporting development, both capital and the operating development. And then you have to look at maybe even your scope limits and the levels and the zones and everything, you know, to pay for that incremental capital. And, you know, and then, then you may even have to revisit your cost model because now you've got a different production throughput. So just a simple change of changing gold price can, if you're going to do it properly, can uh, be an immense amount of work to actually do it properly. Um, open pit mining is not to the same degree. Um, it's faced with this problem. 
because in open pit they mine everything. So when they mine everything, they're not, you know, the design can be sort of static. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but they mine everything. So then it just becomes a destination question. Is this material going to the mill, the low grade or the waste stockpile? So down the bottom right hand corner, I've got the, the that little flow diagram. I've got a little red kind of box around where I am in the flow diagram or in this process. To, and then as I'm talking to each step. So geotechnical, that's sort of sort of sort of where you start. You know, you need to understand your hydraulic radius limits. You under, need to understand if the ore body is cavable, because that might lean you towards caving methods. And really when you're dealing with a geotechnical engineer, you really want one that's that's not too conservative, not too aggressive, just right. If they're too conservative, then they're gonna really, it might make it very hard to get a project off the ground. Um, if they're too aggressive, then you might be setting yourself up for a lot of problems later to deal with. So hydraulic radius, I'm gonna discuss that a little bit more because that really can define your mining method and your mine design. It'll kind of indicate you know, whether scoping is possible and define those scope sizes, which in turn, will define what your mine design is going to look like. So this is an output. This is what your geotechnical engineer might give you. And this is the, uh, you know, Matthew's stability graph method. And from here, you know, with, with the work they do on this, you know, the stability numbers and whatnot, and, uh, you know, whether you're looking at the back or the end wall or the hanging wall, then it's going to give you some ideas of what your hydraulic radius is. So here in this, in this real life example, we could see they're coming down here, depending what it is, whether it's here, the vertical ends, or if you're looking at the back, let's focus on the back. You know, you're looking, you know, up around um, that six, seven mark of where you're going to be working in as a hydraulic radius. So when I apply, for so those who are not familiar with a hydraulic radius, that's the area of the shape divided by the perimeter. Apologies to, the, to those that are very familiar with this. But it's just a way of quantifying what size hole can I open up without it collapsing. You know, just to put it very simply. Myself, I like to, to put that hydraulic radius, you know, that hydraulic radius, put them into a curve like this to make it very easy for my simple mind to get my head around what happens if I change a particular dimension. So in this case, uh, this particular mine, the limiting factor was the back, so the back hydraulic radius. And that was, you know, looking at this blue line, the, the midpoint was around a hydraulic radius of 5.5. So we were taking, you know, we, we proposed taking scopes 15 meters wide, which meant that then we could go about just over 40 meters long. And if somebody was to say, oh, I'd like to take a 20 meters wide scope, well, sure we can do that but then you can only go about 25, 20 meters long. So I just like this, I just think it's an easy way to, for me to understand and communicate to people the impact of hydraulic radius in your scope design. The mining method. So you know, there's lots of different mining methods. Uh, you know, they're largely driven by the geometry and the geomechanical factors and there are variants, you know, and adaptations to mining methods. You can combine hybrids, I've done this, I've, of combined methods to try to take bits and pieces out of two different methods to try, create a third method that might be better suited to a particular uh, geometry or you know particular ground that you're dealing with. So don't feel you have to be limited to just what the textbook example is. I mean, you can you can modify and tweak them a bit to suit your things that may give you better value and may be better suited to your particular project. So. Here I'm going to talk a little bit about your mine design. So there's a couple of tools out there, and there's, there's probably more, but you know certainly MSO. That, that's a huge one. Anybody that's dealing with underground should know what MSO is. You also got Puno. Again, they're tools. You have to be a little careful that at the end of the day it's just a tool, and you have to know how to use the tool properly and uh, make sense of it for it to give you real value. And generally speaking, just a general comment which I'll expand upon is that it's tool design in a high labour cost environment like the US, Australia, Canada. Generally, bigger is usually better. Uh, to, to explain that better further, let's just take a, a simple truck. So you've got a truck here, you've got a 60 ton, a 30, a 20, a 10, and you, you've got different truck sizes. And let's just assume that the truck stock cycle time is one hour. It takes one hour to go from the scope or wherever it's going to up to the, the mill processing facility and return. So it's pretty simple, you know, 60, you know, one load an hour, 60 tons an hour, 30 tons an hour, pretty straightforward math there. And let's put a truck driver on there. Just the truck driver, that's all we're looking at. So his labor is 
say, you know, keep the math simple, $60 now, that's what you've got to pay for him. And, you know, you, you can try to convince the guy driving the 10 ton truck that you only pay, want to pay him $10 an hour, but I don't think you'll have much luck. So really, there, it's going to be a flat line. You're going to pay him all 60 bucks now. So what does that mean? It means when you look at a cost per ton, and again, I'm simplifying this, but cost per ton, there's quite a range there. So you've got a dollar a ton that costs you to move some fuel to 60 ton versus a 10 ton truck that's going to cost you six bucks. So if you had 10 million tons to move the life of mine, you know, that's quite a bit of difference, you know, $10 million to move all the material with a 60 ton truck versus 60 million with a 10 ton truck. Um, you know, very simple math. Uh, I guess all I'm saying here is that this is a trade-off that is not done, uh, well, not often done, as actually optimizing early in your mining project, what is the correct size for your ore body for your truck? Uh, I'm planning and hoping to give a talk next year with a colleague, um, Brandon Keller. He may or may not be on the call. So he, uh, we had planned to do it this year, but we I was just swamped with work and uh, he actually uh, got ill. Uh, so we, um, we're planning hopefully to do it next year. We're actually going to give a talk to help go through in detail how you should correctly optimize the size of the decline in context of truck size and the impact it can have on your total life of mine cost. So now we're into the down here into the slope limit optimization. So slope limit optimization that's sort of the, the first step in trying to clean out some of the noise and start optimizing your mine design. This is done on a free cash flow basis, which is quite quite straightforward. And you would do it first on a slope by slope to make sure each slope is paying for its incremental operating development. And then you're going to do a level by level to make sure each level is paying for the capital to, to access that level. And then you're going to do it on a zone by zone to make sure if you've got different deposits or different veins or ore bodies or whatnot, they're paying for the incremental capital to access that particular zone or load. So let's look at an example. Here's a very, very simple example. Is here you, you look in the long section of a level and you've got three slopes there. So, you know, and back here, you know, this is the cross cut back here, this is where you access. So here's the top cut, here's the bottom cut. So let's look here, we've got a slope at the end, you know, marginal slope at the end. And if you just look at the profit of that, so oh, that's making a hundred thousand dollars profit. Okay, very good. But you may have this development to access through waste that's a hundred grand here, a hundred grand there. So overall, you've actually lost a hundred grand. You know, it's pretty really simple stuff. But this this, you know, this seldom is this, you know, a lot of times, particularly, you know, early stage you know, struggling projects, this is not done, but it's, you know, straightforward math. So in this case, you know, you're going to create value for the project by actually getting rid of that because that doesn't make money. So you'd actually be better off for the project to eliminating that last little slope. Okay, let's expand that to a level by level analysis. So we take those two slopes that we're pretty happy with, they make money. So let's look at those. You know, let's just say each of those make 300K each. But if you look at the capital development to get down that level, well, if you add all that up, your engineers should be able to add up pretty quick. There's a million dollars of capital we need to spend to get down there. So, okay, 600 grand and it's going to cost you a million dollars to get to it. Doesn't really make sense. So, again, you could improve the value of your project by just getting rid of that level. And let's look at zone, you know, look at a zone. So here, that, that zone, this little zone that we went to taste, maybe that made $6 million in profit from the, op you know, operating profit. But the capital to get there was $10 million. Well, again, that probably doesn't make sense. So again, in this case, well, maybe this whole zone, the best thing we can do for this project is actually kill off this, this zone. Maybe this is just a small little satellite ore body casing. So, you know, not hard, um, but again, it, it's, you know, it's not done that often. You know, I do a bit of due diligence and, and seldom do I see that done in any sort of structured process. So look, it's not rocket science. It is rock science though. Um, it's not that difficult, but we should be doing it. And, you know, I don't see it done that often. Uh, sometimes, but not not consistently. Okay, mining sequence. So you know, the, probably one of the the better tools that we've seen in the last year has been Deswick or the similar ones, Mine Two Four D and those. And certainly Deswick, uh, you know, is one of the more popular ones. Uh, just a word of warning with that: it is a tool. Again, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself. It is a tool, and this is a great quote I got out of a, a ventilation handbook from AMC Consulting in Australia is that the user friendliness of the latest software has encouraged large number of inexperienced but computer literate engineers to have a go. Impressive graphical output is produced, but the answers are often wrong. And I, I, again, I do a bit of due diligence and I see this. We see wonderfully impressive 
uh, mind sequencing and scheduling. But, you know, I spent the first half of my career in operations. And once I dig into the sequencing, you know, they're not, they're not practical. They're not going to work. You know, that's not how things are done underground. So, again, a lot of these softwares are very powerful. They're great. But you have to have experienced people using it or giving oversight to it to make sure you're getting meaningful results out of it. So now into schedule optimization, another great tool, and you know there's other ones, but certainly one of the more popular ones out there is SOC, you know, schedule optimization tool. Uh, again, word of warning, it's a guide, not an absolute answer. So it can give you some run, wonderful direction, but again, it, it's a tool. You have to be very careful. I've seen some people take it as gospel and you know, you can get some answers out of that that are not practical, not you can't execute on them. But uh, again, used correctly, it can be very powerful and give you some wonderful value. Mining costs, uh, they must be dynamic and responsive. Uh, Xerus, again, a tool, it's, it's a powerful tool, it's, you know, it's a good tool, but it's only a tool, and if you don't have the right people using it with the right inputs, uh, you'll get meaningful answers out of it, you know, junk in, junk out. A simple dollar per ton won't cut it. You can't do this kind of work with a dollar per ton. All that's gonna do is drive you to a low production rate high and a high cutoff grade, but that's, not the reality because you go to a lower production rate, your mining cost is going to go up. Uh, you know, just again, of, uh, you know, it can go on and on about costs. But, you know, if you look at costs, underground costs, they're broadly broken into direct costs and indirect costs, and they're, they're the subheadings. And with that, generally, indirect costs are mostly sort of fixed, you know, not, not strictly fixed, you know, and I can go in a rant for an hour on this at least. But uh, they're mostly fixed, and the direct costs are mostly variable costs. So, you know, as, as you go down a production rate, your administration support costs are going to go up a lot in a cost per tonne. So you have to have a very dynamic and responsive cost model to be able to do this stuff. So as you run different mine plans, you're getting realistic costs out of it. And again, to reinforce, you know, a cost model, this is the first principles cost model. Um, the pivot point is your equipment. The equipment point is really the pivot point of, you know, the foundation of a cost model. Getting your equipment input factors correct and, and is you know, critical to accurately developing a responsive cost model. It's also critical for managing your cost. Uh, you know, we, we now, the whole mines, modern mining operates around equipment. You know, certainly some of the older metrics of you know, tons per man shift. That goes back to the jack leg handheld days where really everyone was effectively using the same piece of equipment, which was just jack leg. But now it's really equipment driving. So, you know, some of those metrics are not so useful anymore. So it's really important to understand, you know, around equipment. So here in this, this, this simple flow diagram, um, you can see as your mining physicals come in, your feet, your tons, all that kind of stuff come in, you know, a lot of it feeds the equipment. And the equipment will give you hours. And from the hours, you'll get your maintenance, you'll get your capex, because you're going to have your fleet. You're going to have know how many muckers, how many drills you need. And then, of course, the operating cost of that, that equipment you know, with diesel power, all that kind of stuff, labor, because all your headcount being your operators, your mechanics, are also driven by the hours, either, you know, directly or indirectly through the maintenance. So, you know, it's important to understand your equipment when you're building a first principle cost model. So your financial model, so financial model is, is going to then be used to define, okay, have you maximized value? Which then brings you to the question, well, what is value? I mean, is NPV, F3 cash flow, IRR, profitability index, what is it? I mean, uh, you know, the answer is yes. It's just a case of which one you value and which one you rate and rank. And I think, I think you have to use them all. A lot of people prioritize NPV, and it's dangerous to use NPV on its own. Um, you're, you know, if you're using NPV as your sole metric, then you are assuming that you have other numerous projects that meet your discount rate that you can jump into. Because as you've gone into a mine, again, underground mining is a bit different. If you go in and prioritize NPV, you could sterilize a lot of profitable ore that doesn't help the NPV, but maybe it generates free cash flow. And you could go mine all this, sterilize this ore, and you could never, you might not be able to get back to it. And then you've gone and maximize NPV, and then you finish up the mine, and then you don't have another project to go to. You know, what do you do? You know, uh, you know go buy real estate. So... You know, puts you in a, you know, so that's the dangers of NPV. It can promote short term thinking, you know, just what can I get in the next few years? And I don't really care what's happening 10 or 20 years down the track. Um, free cash flow. I mean, free cash flow is great, but it doesn't account for the time value of money and risk adjusted returns. 
So again, you know, it is useful information, but again, by itself, you know, you might might make poor decisions. Um, IRR, um, that's the return on unpaid capital. It's really meaningless unless you have, if you look at look at it along with free cash flow or NPV. Um, it's more of a, a ranking um, means, ranking metric. Profitability index, that's really good. Um, it's not, you know, my opinion that I've, I've seen not used enough, but it's a really great metric for comparing projects, um, particularly if you're capital constrained. It's a really way of um, rating and ranking, but again, you need to use that um, with NPV and free cash flow to, to understand. So when you do NPV, and NPV is very popular, a lot of people are doing NPV, um, your discount rate, well, we, you know, a lot of people know it's a number, but how do you build that up? Well, you know, it, it's not super complicated, but it, it's very subjective. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna have WAC, your weighted average cost of capital, and then you want a premium on that, because, uh, you know, you wanna make a profit on top of your, your WAC. And then you're gonna add some other risk. And that could be country risk, you know, certainly doing business in Venezuela is going to be a whole lot different than doing business, you know, in US or Canada. Uh, you're going to have a stage risk, you know, you're going to view a project that's in initial assessment or concept a lot different than a project that's in feasibility or an operating mine. And resource confidence, again, you know, how much risk are you going to undertake for a project that's ruled out to inferred versus a project that's ruled out to indicated or measured. So a lot of these, your discount rate is really how much risk are you willing to take and what hurdle do you want to jump? A question for the group, and, and we will get, you know, if we have time at the end, depending on how much time we have to chat, we should have enough time, but I'll leave this for people to ponder and maybe even chat amongst themselves on the chat, is what discount rate should you use for closure costs? So I'll leave that one with you. Okay, hill of value. Now that is the process to identify maximum value, and as we saw previously, well, you know, what is value? So you have to understand what, what you believe value to be but it's going to be a process where you go through and try to figure out what, what mine plan, what approach and design gives me the maximum value. Typically, in a typical, in a classic hill of value is trading off cutoff grade versus production rate. So as you have a lower cutoff grade, then you've got more tons, which might mean you can go at a higher production rate. Consequently, if you go with a higher cut upgrade, then you may have more, a smaller resource to mine, and then that may drive your production rate down. And really, healer values, where's that sweet spot? You know, there's a sweet spot somewhere where you're kind of balancing them out right, and you're going to get, you know, maximum value for the project. So cut upgrade. So cut upgrade, as we know, is, you know, mining operating costs plus your processing operating costs plus site overheads, and you divide that by your process recovery multiplied by the metal price. No, wrong, that's not cut off grade, that's break even grade. Uh, people use the term interchangeably a lot and, and they're different. You know, break even grade is where you don't lose money, but you probably don't want to design a mine around your break even grade because you know, if, you, if your break even grade is three grams a ton and you go mine a stope at three grams a ton, then you haven't made any money. All you've done is gone and you know, paid um, to go blow up a bunch of rocks. You know, and it cost you nothing, but you didn't make any money either. So to further illustrate the difference between break-even grade and cut-off grade, so here I've got a curve, and this is just, you know, talking to gold. So, you know, in the yellow, you've got the gold equivalent ounces at each cut-off grade. That would be, three, you know, that'd be grams per ton. These are just some made-up numbers. Um, you know, the, the red one is your relative free cash flow, and the green one is the relative NPV to a cut-off grade that you might use for your mine. So, if you designed your mine around, say, a, a typical break-even grade, say around three grams for a long haul stoke for three, thereabouts, so that's going to, you're, that's going to, you're going to maximize your free cash flow if you go with that approach. And that's the old school cut off grade. Now, if you optimize your cut off grade to, to NPV, you might be up around five. That's maybe where the maximum NPV is. But again, what do you value? If you're just chasing free cash flow, then operate down here, operate at that. If you're chasing NPV, if that's what you really care about, it might be up there. If you wait, if you value them equally, then you might pick somewhere in the middle, you know, and you could stack them. You could, you know, come up, well, you could wait, um, you could easily kind of, you got the data, you could easily weigh up, you know, where is for your definition of value, where should you be operating your cutoff grade? So, you know, it's gonna be somewhere in between there. It's gonna be higher than that, 
it might be typically, you know, if you're going to lean anyway, you're going to lean to the lower side of your NPV optimized cut upgrade to pick up a bit more free cash flow. Just to complicate things, you also the lower cut upgrade you go, the more ounces you get. And a lot of analysts, mining analysts, really get hung up on ounces and they, they value, you know, projects and companies based on the reserve and resource declared ounces. Um, but that doesn't, you know, more ounces doesn't always equate to maximum value for the company shareholders in terms of, you know, return and, you know, cash flow. And this is really, you know, a bit of the, the tail wagging the dog that, you know, sometimes, you know, the mining industry is pressured to maximize ounces that are maybe not the best quality ounces just to give the perception of a higher value company or project according to the analysts. Cut off grade optimization. So let, let's talk a little bit about cut off grade optimization because you know we can talk about like, this a lot. So cut off grade, you know, as we classically know, is a is assumed cost a fixed per ton. So you know when you look at cut off grade, you know, it is a fixed cost per ton. Now that's not true. In reality, trucking is not a fixed cost per ton. The trucking is actually conducted on a ton mile or a ton kilometer, and it all depends how far you away from the destination. So if you're looking at a mine very, if you're looking at a stoke, you know, and assume a trucking, a haulage mine, if you're hauling from the bottom of the mine and you're hauling a long way from the bottom mine to the mill, your trucking cost per ton is going to be a lot different than a stoke that's near the portal. So the costs are not fixed, they're variable. Likewise with processing, you know, I've seen some projects where the processing costs can vary wildly, um, a huge, depending on the makeup of that, where, where a, you think the high grade soap is actually making you more money, but it might have very complex geochemistry that means it's very expensive to process versus one that's a lower grade, but actually got simple geochemistry and actually makes more money. Which leads into really you should look at it value instead of grade. You know, the open pit guys do this. They look at, you know, blocks in terms of value. They don't look at it in terms of cut of grade. And we can do that. We've got the software now to do it. And you know, Henry's done it. I've worked with Henry's built you know, huge, big, long formulas to, you know, calculate the processing costs for a block, depending on the, the god awful long, you know, formula. The processing guys are given saying, this is what it'll cost to mine this or depending on whatever your geochemistry is. And then from there, then we can visualize in Deswick or whatever software, we can visualize what, what soaps are making you the most money. What are the most valuable? Not necessarily the high grade. There's a correlation, but it's not always a one for one. So, um, uh, just to summarize your cutoff grade value optimization is really just three important rules, you know, as you go to understand cutoff grade and cutoff value is, is optimized cutoff grade or cutoff value is an output. It's not an input. Optimized cutoff grade, cutoff value is not an input, it is an output. And don't forget rules one and two. So you, you have to get your head around that that the uh, cutoff grade is not an input. It's not something you plug in, it's something you get at the back end after you've done a hill of value assessment. And that'll tell you what cutoff grade you should be using. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to Henry. Henry is going to step through some real life examples that Henry and I worked on a number of years ago uh, to give, you know, give demonstration of how we, or certainly Henry and, and you know, certainly I've supported Henry a lot on this, on implementing this process, this approach. So if you could uh, hand over to Henry, Lucas, I'll mute myself for a bit. Working, Henry. Okay, so can everybody hear me? Try to share my screen. Look nice. Can you please? Oh, I got a message. Say Zoom quit unexpectedly. Uh, that's a bummer. That's never good. You can also try and let me try it again. Got it. Just 
Do you have the slides, Chris? Otherwise, it might be easier if you just share and I might have just lost Henry. You there, Henry? Lost yeah, him. no, I think it should be good. I just, uh, I'm going to try it again. There we go. There we go. There you go. Yeah. All right. Everything seems working. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lucas, and thanks, Henry, for the invitation and set things up. I, when Chris was talking, I, I clicked through the top bar. Uh, there are a lot of uh, family faces, uh, your friends, coworkers. Thank you for calling in. Um, so, Chris just gave us a really good introduction about. Process. So I'm going to jump uh, right into a case study, uh, a project that Chris and me work, and many others, uh, some call in today, that have been working this for more than almost ten years. So, um, so you know, Chris talked about the cutoff. So really, the cutoff is is often a, a focal point for underground mine planning. Uh, a lot of things. It's not just about cutoff, right? It's just not just a number you plug in, and then you got a mine. And there, there are a lot of other things, you know, the price, cost, um, uh, you know, fixed and variable, production rate, you know, you know all, all that come to play. So it, it is really the build a relationship around the cutoff, right? And, and how, how you are. Um, um, so nowadays there are, there are tools, I uh, empower you to do more in the, uh, we, I remember when I started with Newmont about 14 years ago in Nevada, uh, the geology handed me a block model. There was about one million ounces, you know, asked me to do some design. So after three months of clicking, digitizing, I said, well, there's about, you know, 300,000 ounces. And uh, uh, the mine manager and the project man was not too happy. He said, well, what about you, you change your stoop size and, and change the cover to a few more rounds? I said, well, how many time you give to me? They thought, well, I don't have three more months. You have maybe a couple of weeks to read the whole thing. So that just, you know, put a lot of pressure to, to the engineers. Uh, and, and sometimes, yeah, you, you say, well, we can hire more engineers to do, but it's very tedious. It's very tedious. Nowadays we have tools, and, you know, like MSO and some other scheduling, um, you know, uh, and, and optimization tools. It just really changed the way we do our mind planning. Um, so I'm going to just get, you know, present some, some information about the project. Uh, you know, we talk about is a one in our uh, South America operation. When we started this about, you know, 10 years ago, eight, nine years ago, they're, they're about to, to care of the project. So you can see the open pit finishes oxide ore and uh, they drill some, you know, uh, identifies as underground the potential. But I, after some, you know, high level designs, you were used 2.5 gram per ton to cut off again, the break even as, as uh, very typical as Chris mentioned. And uh, the look at, and it's a sulfide ore, right? They look at the estimation of the, the autoclave cost and you put it together, it's not, again, not enough to pay for it. So they were say, well, um, we are going to dump and backfill the pit because there's another marginal open pit project they want to dump, dump and backfill this pit. We were, so for us, it was, well, it's the greatest good. It's, it's 10 to 20 gram material. There, there's a potential maybe give us an, another chance. So we, we started working on it with many other folks and you know, uh, study directors and you know, many, many people. And, and nowadays this become one of our best uh, project uh, and, can, and continue growing. So it's, it's been a really good story. Uh, but before you start to build a model, or like like saying this, make sure you understand your your data, the re, the input. Do some analysis. Check your, you know, for example, you run MSO with a block amount nowadays. You can do a lot and fairly quickly. What's the you know grade tonnage curve? You know the tons and, and grade, uh, and also the ounces and development meters. Worth your cutoff give you a sense how 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 sensitive it is to cutoff. Um, and, and also your, your cost, right? The, the mining cost, the process cost, is not just a total cost, it's the fixed and variable cost. And sometimes that, that play a very big role. And make sure you done this analysis, make sure that they are valid. Um, here is a few uh, snapshot about the project and, and some of the model uh, we did. 
So we look at the distribution of the all body. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, definitely you can see some high grade, you can see the legend, right? We have high grade of 10, you know, uh, above, and you have a lot of material that's, you know, under four grand, you know, so what do you do? Are you getting mine from one direction or another or one from bottom to top? And, you know, do you have flexibility uh, to, to attack a different area? So at the end, and uh, very shortly, we, we, we realize if we can, you know, mine and this all body in, in two phases. First phase is really focus on the high grade, right? If you have to go through low grade, don't, don't worry about the low grade. It sterilize a little bit, but if you can save it later, that would be great. But the first five to seven years are really important to attack the high grade. Um, uh, so uh, we build a HOV model um, that, that helped us to explore the re relationship between the mining rates, uh, the cost, stove size, and MPV and free, uh, free cash flow and other uh, indicators too. So here's a few, um, you know, snapshot. One is MPV versus cutoff and production rate. Another one, so you just turn the discount rate into zero, that gives you free cash flow versus, you know, cutoff. And per so that, that gives you a quite, you know, a good uh, overview of the, the relationships, right, where you should be operating. You don't need to exactly be on the top. For example, when, when price change, when other things change, the hill may move, right? may over, up and down, left and right. Uh, so it, it's not a static, right? It's dynamic. But make sure you explore your opportunities with, with tools. There, there are other, many other things to consider when you do scheduling too, right? Make sure you follow the geotech, the validation, the processing, and other, uh, other, other, other guidance. I, and that's the one thing I learned for this particular all body that uh, the nation is very important because the software all has, you know, if we can make that work, it's going to, you know, hunt us down the road. And same thing with geotech. And, and you know, sometimes geotech, you know, engineers tell you, you know, you can do this and do that. But actually, in reality, there actually, there's a, some flexibility, right? So you need to do some trade-off. What's the right stoop size? What's, uh, you know, um, make sure you understand the relationship, the, the pros and cons, and how you model that. And uh, at the end, there's, there's, there's sometimes can be conflict uh, goals or objectives, right? Some people think NPV is the most important. Uh, that's how we do our financial models, but that's not the only one. There, there are many other things. Um, um, one time I was asked by a, a, a study director, can we have more answers and higher grade? Um, I said, well, mathematically that's, that's almost impossible, but Maybe we can have you know higher grade in the early years, but overall we have more answers. But is that doable, right? So we have to do the work. So here is is another uh, view how we look at. So the HOV model uh, that's 3D. Now we just turn it into a front view or, or slice view, a 2D, and you can see the relationship and how the model, the hill, uh, when you you know look at the MPV. Uh, uh, and the free cash flow, right? If you, you think of NPV is important, then your cutoff, again, is not a one point, right? It's a range, right? Somewhere from four gram per ton to six gram per ton, you are safe, right? Things can change, right? Change gold price, change the cost, change stove side, backfill, all that. These things actually change. A production rate, rate is a big, big one. You can see that too, right? And, and if you think, you know, more ounces or free cash flow is important than that, can go a lot lower. The cutoff can go lower. Some can go you know, as low as uh, two and a half. But you can see that if I have actually a, a wider plot uh, b below um, uh, two gram, there is actually a, a cliff, almost a vertical. So it's quite a dangerous. You don't want to get too close to the cliff or be too greedy. If you use a higher gold price, you're thinking, oh, maybe I can move to two and a half or two. Uh, the, there are a lot of marginal material can turn into a negative or hurt your project very quickly uh, when, when things change or you have uh, you know, a cost increase by 20%. So just, just be, be cautious. So what do we, you know, after we've done detailed scheduling, uh, we realize because offset all body, you can see the high grade in a different zones, there's actually offset the east and west and deep. there actually, you can give you access, even you do bottom up mining, you don't have to do bottom up everywhere. There are opportunities you can start from mining the high grade uh, in, in the early years. 
So you can see from our, 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 our grid profile, this is after all the detailed work, life of mind profile, right? We were able to get to very high grade uh, in, in the early years and maintain relatively high grade for five to six years. And then we just, you know, to again, to maximize ounces or, or, or profitable ounces and, uh, you know, reserve, we, we include most of the, the lower grade material. And, and the ore body is still growing, right? There may be opportunity to find a more high grade, but this is just what we know at that time. Um, Okay, here is a short video. I hope to show and play. Uh, I have longer versions, but it's a very short just for time being. How we actually, um, you know, capitalize the strategic plan to actually detail, right? Right. The Excel model we, we built, this is for presentation versions. There are actually more and more uh, detailed ones, more control drop downs than this. It's just uh, a version for presentation. So. Again, change the gold price, right? Because you see the hero go up and down, the NPV go. But the, cut, the optimal color was actually relatively stable. Change the backfill, and other things actually can have some influence to the hill. Um, and that, because they change the cost structure and mining sequence sometimes. And then, you know, different stoop size, sub level, minimum waste, that has impact to your, your uh, and it turned out actually this more selective, smaller stoops give you better MPV for this case. Um, again, at the end, can we, you know, transfer this strategy into detailed plan? You can say because of the offset, because of different zones uh, we, we achieved, uh, we were able to mine high grade stoops in the early years. Uh, but again, you still have to have other things like ventilation, other things, uh, you know, access inference just set up before you do that. So that's already in place. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when time goes away, we, we are learning more about this deposit, uh, there's, you know, additional, uh, but we feel like at that time, that was really, uh, you know, having this kind of model, do this kind of work is a really good way to uh, explain to the managers why we pick this color, why we are doing this kind of mining layout, layout and this type of mine plan. Um, at, at the end, I want to acknowledge, I know actually I saw uh, Chris and Brian Corey in. I'm super happy you guys can make it. Uh, I know this has been a very tough year for some of the seniors uh, around the world, uh, the pandemic, but uh, maybe you guys are doing pretty good. Um, I just want to acknowledge you that there's just a huge amount of work um, by, by Chris and, and Brian um, in, uh, for the industry that really uh, change the way how we do mind designs, change the philosophy how we do, you know, we view cutoff. Uh, the, the, I, I carry Brian's book anywhere I go, you know, when book at the board, I read your book. Uh, um, and and uh, anyway, those are two are great mentors. There's a lot of people like this, you can learn a lot from them. And um, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much, Henry and Chris. That was awesome. Um, definitely some. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, one more slide there. Josh, I'll just uh, share my screen and then I'll pop it up. Sounds good. Let's see. Get it back. There we go. Okay, so we're just wrapping up on, on this, so just the last two slides. So we've got here the, just that flow, just kind of explaining visually the process of how you go through all that. So that's what we stepped through and Henry spent a lot of his time really talking about the hill of value, so that, that's where he did a lot of his work and, and the implementation that has on the cutoff value. Um, so in summary, you know, is, is look at what we've, we've got here is, you know, truly optimizing underground mine is not an easy task, but the rewards can be immense. Um, you require a clear strategy, what you're doing, and you require strong tacticians that they, they know what they're doing at each step. You know, having um, wonderful whiz bang people on the software is not enough. You actually have to understand what you're doing and having, you know, good experience in mining. And optimal cutoff grade is an output, not an input. Uh, so that, that kind of wraps up me. I will uh, I'll just kind of point out, there's the book that uh, Henry's referring to. And uh, you know, great book that's, a kind of, uh, it's probably the first book on cutoff grade that actually 
fits well to underground. There's other books that have been out there, but they're, they're really very open pit centric and open pit and underground are quite distinct in how they approach this. I mean, that, that book has, um, and I, I've, um, even before I knew Brian Hall and even read this book, I, I had my own, uh, you know, done enough to know that, uh, you know, the, the cutoff grade theory was not good. What, you know, what was, uh, I guess conventional. And I had gotten to some, let's just call them debates, probably the nicest term way to put them with some people on this. And then when I read Brian Hall's book, it was wonderful because then I could just go, um, highlight a section and say, okay, like, clearly I don't know what I'm talking about, but here's a guy that published the book, um, pretty much saying the exact same thing I'm trying to say. So, uh, you know, so then I, you know, kind of uh, have used him as a reference, you know, to kind of, uh, yeah, so certainly a lot of, it's a foundation, a lot of this work, it's really good stuff in there. So if you get the chance, get that book. And, uh, you know, Brian, I expect, you know, a t-shirt if you sell any copies on that little promo there. Anyway, that wraps me up. I did see Brian Thanks, Hall Chris. kind of, no worries. But yeah, well, um, that wraps up for me. So I guess we can uh, open it up to questions. Um, I'm not sure if you want to, you want to facilitate that, Lucas, or you just want me to go through? Yeah, I think so far we had uh, one question and a bit of a discussion between Enzo and. Do you see the question? Then you just can just go ahead and then. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go up the top and just see. Um, Renzo, thanks, Chris. I had a question some years ago. Brian Hall and Gerald Whittle wrote papers, books about something really kind of very hot. Most of them in there. This is different parts of the implementation of mine operations. Uh, looks like we've got a few responses to that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, it looks like there is there's, uh, looks like there's a discussion already going in there. So I, I don't, I think I'll just scan over that. Um, I just, yeah, it, you, you're right. I mean, you know, I'll just, just without reading everybody, so it's, it's quite a conversation. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not, it's not nothing, none of this is easy. Um, you know, but but at least at least you're getting closer to the right answer. You know, approximately right versus precisely wrong. So you know, looking at different elements of this and trying to understand. You know, and you, and you got issues of of if you prioritize uh, NPV too much, you might be high grading and sterilizing material too much. So you got all these things you have to juggle and look, and it's all a case by case. But look, I think you need to move in, in this direction to some degree to get closer to where, you know, approximately right versus precisely wrong. And certainly just running your whole mine and break even grade, uh, which, you know, a lot of mines do. A lot of mines just purely break even grade. Yeah, you'll maximize uh, free cash flow. But again, you know, is that really delivering best value for the company? But I'm not, not gonna, yeah, we've got a, a big long discussion on here. Uh, uh, Chris, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, when um, I was working with Rand Gold uh, in Lulo Mine in Mali, uh, we had five and a half by um, almost uh, five and a half uh, meter uh, drifts uh, to support 60 ton trucks. And I always wondered if um, those were big openings. I always wondered uh, it cost a lot of money to develop them and uh, decline and uh, Yep. everything else. I always wondered uh, if we should go and, and get a uh, 30 ton smaller trucks and make that op those openings to maybe uh, four by four and a half meters. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, so the, when, when you're considering size of trucks, it's not just labor costs, but there's a lot of development costs involved. What is your experience on that? Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. I've done those trade-offs. Great question. And that's what I'm going to hopefully address in next year's SME um, with my colleague, that exact thing. He, he started, it was actually interesting. I got a colleague, he was doing his MBA. He reached out to me of, of what is a mining problem. So I gave it to him and he found it fascinating. So he worked on it a bit and it's about that. And and what it is, it's your, your trade-off of your operating cost of your fleet versus the capital cost of putting in a decline. And the third tier to it is actually ventilation. Because if you're using your decline as part of your ventilation network, the bigger the hole, then the lower resistance. And actually you've got a, a third leg to the stool, so to speak. Um, it's a minor stool, but they're, they're the two big ones. And it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case scenario because it depends on the size of deposit, depending on the life of mine material you have to move. The more material you've got, if, you, if you've got 1 million tons versus 100 million tons, I mean, you're going to get a different answer. 
because, of course, you know, the capital is going to be a lot longer and maybe then drives you to a bigger truck. And a, a very important one is your labour cost itself because you're going to get a lot different answer if you're looking at Mali versus looking at, you know, Western Australia or America because your labour cost is so big. And you're, you're right on the decline, but it's not a linear relationship because a lot of your decline costs are fixed per metre. So it doesn't matter if it's a three by three or a five by five, you have certain costs that are fixed per metre, you know, like your piping and your electrical. And there's other things that are, that are sort of variable. Some are semi-variable, like, like your ground support. Again, it's not linear. So re really the, the answer is, is you should do that trade-off. So you should do that and, and properly analyse for your scenario, for your case, you know, what should you be doing. And I guess my frustration is that I've seen projects that where they've gone in and done a five by five, the, you know, expiration decline, and that's what they continue on with the life of the mine. And it's such a, a massive decision that they have huge consequences to the operating cost and the profitability or the maximizing profit that nobody gives it a second thought. You know, they, they're, up, they're focusing on other things and oh, how many engineers should you have? And there'll be debates day in, day out about how many, what the staff level should be in the org structure, but nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but seldom do I see somebody say, let's do a trade-off study on what the decline size should be and what truck size, you know, what basically what truck size and what decline should match that and what makes sense for this project. So hopefully, I mean, yeah, I haven't given you a clear answer. So it's... Oh, I, I, I thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, your presentation. Thank you very much, Henry. Thanks for coming and uh, giving you. the... Uh, yeah, so, so your particular question, hopefully next year's SME, I'll be giving a talk on that. Great, thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. It. All right. There was uh, one question from Alvar. It's basically uh, alluding to or asking about how, how mines that or operations that actually implement were implemented after you uh, did those calculations. How close did they actually stick to? to your models, is there anything you can share on that? Um, um, yeah, personally, um, I can't share a lot as first-hand uh, experience. I know certainly, I saw Ralph was on there and I know, you know, we did heal a value for an operation and that's an, that's an active operation he's working on. He might be able to chime in. Henry might be able to chime in as far as active because the projects we're working on are, are mostly we're working on to getting them into production and then once they reach up, you know, once they're into production and then we're kind of spending time on the next project. But as far as, you know, how the challenges uh, of meeting those expectations and trying to execute, because of course everything looks good on paper and then you quite often get short term urgent needs or requests or, or a mine manager that, that kind of, no, I'm, I'm going to ignore that long term plan. I'm going to focus on what uh, gives me the best bonus for this year. Um, you've got all different uh, motives, but uh, I guess yeah, I just saw Ralph pop up, and I, I think I didn't read his answer, but I know earlier on he said so he can maybe chime in from his experience just because he's familiar with this, he's familiar with Henry and myself, he's familiar with the Hill of Value process uh, that that we did with Newmont. Yeah, so I can I can jump in there, Chris. Um, thanks, and that was a, a, a great presentation um, for the for the optimization. I think the the challenge is is we try to. When we talk about optimization of schedule, it's not really the same necessarily as optimization of cutoff and what's the best cutoff for, for what you can achieve for your production rate. And that can really work over, um, you know, a, a, a range of, you know, what's minor, minor changes that you're going to occur on the mine site. Um, in terms of optimization of schedule, um, I think it's fair to say that the minute a schedule is created, it's wrong. Um, it's going to get changed immediately once you start to go into operations and every year that needs to be updated. So look, you're always, you're always um, updating and redoing that, that, uh, that, I guess that optimization loop in, in terms of that area. But if you're, if you know that you're in the, uh, the right area for production rate and you're approximately in the right area for, for cutoff, you've maximized your value um, for what I can see. Um, and really getting those two things right um, is probably the, the most important things that you can achieve for your, for your mine plan. Um, and not necessarily, let's, let's say, getting the, the schedule exactly to, to, uh, to what you, um, you put out there. Um, you know, because decisions on, on mine sites will always change uh, depending on the new opportunities that, that might come along based on drilling um, or, or other factors um, that'll come along. So it, it's really um, getting that, that first pass 
for for production rate and cutoff that that's really really where, where your value is thanks so much Ralph. um we're kind of uh, over the hour already um so i'd really like to first uh, say thank you to, to chris and henry to spend the time and give that uh, fantastic presentation really really cool really in depth but uh, still easy enough to follow i think for for many people in here that are not super entrenched in the field so thank you so much for that uh, chris and henry with over 200 people joining so again yeah just just one kind i did see a couple of people asking for the presentation i have posted it um uh, the one that i pre actually presented uh we presented at sme it's on my linkedin page so if you go to my linkedin page you should find it you should be able to download it from there i'll go check to make sure that that works um yeah just uh see so yeah, i think that's still a post up there so yeah just chris johnson um yeah, you should find me somewhere in there, but um, that's where it is. So if you want to download, you can get it off LinkedIn. I've, I've put it up there, yeah, late. So it was early last year, around March, early last year, just after the SME, for that reason, people are asking for a copy. Sounds good. Are you allowing us to share that on YouTube as well? I haven't checked. Uh, is that going to be a problem? Otherwise, we'll also, if you're okay with that, we would be uploading it, the whole presentation. Yeah, yeah, we can. You know, I mean, this one here is a little different. I added a few more slides, and we've, uh, the only diff I'll get with Henry. We'll have to, just because we were um, having a few issues, just getting some new additional slides over to me. So I just said, okay, we'll, we'll just split it up. But, you know, to have a consolidated presentation, I'll get with Henry, and we'll just make sure it's one consolidated presentation. And I'll share it with you, and then you can um, put it on your link as well, if you like. Sounds good. Cool. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for, for joining. Thank you everyone who's still in here. Um, we've got one more question I have here. If you have got a minute and you want to answer that, that would be awesome. Otherwise, thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about the use of uh, drones in underground environments. So a bit different of a topic, more operational, more techie. Um, so whoever is interested in that, we to put a link in, uh, in the chat box um, for our LinkedIn event. Just follow us and uh, hopefully see you next week. Um, Lucas, yes. if uh, uh, our presenters take one more question, I have one question for Henry. And, uh, okay, so uh, we have two more questions, then, I guess. Yeah. Are you okay with staying on for a sec or still go? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Cool. Um, I'm just going to read the question I got here, uh, Kadri, and then I'm going to hand it over yeah, to you. Um, so Javier was asking an, in an individually uh, stope profit evaluation might remove many stopes that have high contaminated rates. Do you consider blending material by level zone uh, or all the mine as an as a strategy to maximize the value of the project instead of removing a first pass during the stope profit evaluation? Removing at first pass, sorry. Uh, I think I understand the question, not 100% sure, but I think they kind of ask, you know, I guess maybe it's the question is around certainty of the the gold is where you think it is if you've got certainty you know if you you know if you've got certainty that the gold is where you think it is then yes you should eliminate these lower lower grade soaps these ones that are not adding value because um, removing them actually adds value to your project uh, certainly if you're at early stage um, indicated or inferred level at least at third level there you, you again I, I could appreciate that you might be a little um you may not want to be too aggressive in eliminating stuff because your uncertainty is there I, again I'm, I'm just that's sort of my understanding i'm not sure if, if you interpret that question different lucas yeah you're on mute i think it was uh, yeah basically around uh, focusing on contaminated grades so i'm not sure there was no yeah, so, I'm not, so. yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure what the contaminated gray means, but I think that's maybe what it means. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, they can um, message me and then I can follow up later or, or get me yeah. through LinkedIn or something if you want to further the discussion. But I think that's what I'm around. But yeah, I appreciate that. You, you don't want to get too crazy and, and being, you know, again, approximately right versus precisely wrong. You don't want to go in an early stage project that's been inferred and going through and oh this this scope over here you know doesn't make money when really if you've got whole spacings and haven't drilled it out so you don't want to be too crazy but it's again it's just trying to again narrow in trying to get the uh, circle the wagons around where you should be operating and where the maximum value is cool thanks uh, after a cutter, we also had another question question uh, yeah this question may maybe both uh, chris and henry uh, Henry, at the turquoise ridge, um, 
when Derek came and uh, combined the, the property under Nevada gold mines, and one of the first things they did is they changed the, the cutoff grade and, uh, and they made a big deal out of it. And uh, uh, they found the cutoff grade to be too high when Newmont was operating it and they, they lowered it, right? And any comments on that? Uh, I'm not sure if you got, you got actual knowledge on it. Uh, again, it goes back to what you define as value. I mean, if you're chasing NPV, you, you, your cutoff rate will be different than somebody's chasing free cash flow. And then also, and again, I, I don't want to dig, I'm not the expert in this, but certainly a big part of this uh, joint venture in Nevada is around processing. And certainly there's some, uh, you know, fuel that can, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with which, which all goes to which process facility, but I know certainly there is, uh, you know, there's benefits of the joint venture because then they could uh, obtain like the, the sulfide type fuel uh, ores to help feed the autoclave and supplement the fuel and stuff like that, which may have then reduced processing costs. Yeah, which, then, which was going to increase uh, sage mill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know the the nuances, but yeah, again, when when you start looking at changing up processing and you're getting different feeds of ore, that could change it up, and again, could be the, just how they view value. They're chasing more free cash flow. And you know, free, if you're chasing free cash flow, you're gonna lower your cutoff grade. And, yeah. uh, and and how people look at costs. There's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, yeah, you'd have to really dig into it to understand, to say, you know, what, you know where, where are you heading and what are you trying to get to? I mean, I'm not sure if you can add to that, Henry. Yeah, just, just follow that really quick. So, um, as Chris mentioned, in Nevada, we don't have one mine right on the ground open pit or process we have a lot so you you can look at things or a cutoff for, for this particular you know trgv um as standalone right you know the the, the the material need to blend with sources from other sources you know some material go to concentrate and just very complex so a new model we actually have a in-house and Kadri, you know that in-house uh optimization tool not not so that you know look at you know, the statewide big picture. So it gave us each individual operation side the guidance about their, their, uh, the cutoff. So it's not just one individual side is optimal cutoff or they're doing break even, use higher growth price. You can say, well, your cutoff is too high, but you look at the big picture, which what is the right cutoff, right? And also con has the most contribution to the region. Yeah, great. Uh, I, I, I thought that was, uh related to that, but I just wanted to hear what you think, Henry. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. We have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, Ian Loomis wanted to ask a question, I think. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Chris, Henry, I was gonna ask you a really quick question here and it uh, it looked at the, the, the graphs that Henry was showing with the changing the variables on your hill of value. And I was wondering if there was uh, any any work had been done looking at doing Monte Carlo uh, simulation on your hill to really come up with maybe more of a, rather than a surface coming up with a bubble of where the targets are likely to be. Um, and, and then if the, the hill of value would be flat enough that there may be not be any value to that, right? If the, if the surface has a flat enough top that you simply would say, no, no, <laughs> we know we're gonna be here and it's not gonna change very much. Um, if that makes a, a sense of a question. Yeah, um, we done something, I don't heard about Chris Bulls, another tour as into Excel. So, but that was a separate uh, exercise. Uh, we also do some, you know, some of the colleagues here heard about VRAP. That's also a different uh, process, but exactly like what you, 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 you mentioned, we run some kind of simulation because like all the input, right? It's not fixed, right? You know, price, um, you know, recovery block model, uh, good grade it has a range, right? Since go up and down. So we, we do some, that kind of simulation, but uh, maybe something in the future we can add in, but not in this particular model. I don't know, Brian, you, you've done that some similar thing probably before. 
Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Henry. Uh, look, it's it's something that I've I've considered over the years. Uh, being a consultant, I only get uh, generally paid and have the opportunity to do what the client wants. And uh, uh, as far as the simulations are concerned, and thinking about what the hill of value is supposed to, the hill of value model is supposed to do for you you're basically looking for an area near the top of the hill that says somewhere in this area, the trade-offs between cutoff grades and production rates and all those other things is sort of the, the sweet spot, the right spot to be. And so in a lot of cases, what you would be wanting to do is change the price and see, does, sure, if the price goes up, the hill is going to go up, but does the sweet spot move sideways to suggest a different strategy? And then what's the trade-off between uh, the, the upside risks and the downside rewards if you set up for a high price, but you get a low price and vice versa. So very often, rather than wanting to do probabilities, you'll actually be wanting to uh, look at what happens as you make different assumptions about some of those uncontrollable, unknown future uh, scenarios. But the other way that I did also then think about it was if you did run a simulation, then you would generate potentially hills of value for you know, P5, P10, P50, P75, and so on. And you would look to see, um, you know, does the, uh, does the strategy, does, does the hill move around when you look at different percentiles of probabilities of outcomes? And how is that going to influence your overall decision? So in answer to Ian's question, no, I haven't done it and I'm not aware of anybody who has. Uh, but like everything, you know, like Chris was saying, if you can start wielding these tools, garbage in, garbage out. And then what do you actually do with the results? You, you have to think very carefully about what it is that you're wanting to achieve. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to um, Brian's comments. Um, yeah, tend, tend, to, tend to agree, you know, to, to go back to you, uh, you know, Ian, with the flat hill. I mean, we've seen that, like flat hills, and then... Again, sort of what Brian said, you know, you've got to have a bit of intuition, a bit of knowledge to know where you should be operating. So you look at the hill and, and on the hill, you'll say, okay, let, let's imagine you've got a hill that's pretty flat on NPV. Well, you'll go to the, the, the end, you know, towards where maybe the hill starts dropping off, but you'll go towards the, where the free cash flow is picking up, thinking, okay, if we're going to operate on this hill, on this, on this plateau, let's operate on the part of the plateau that gives us more free cash flow. So we get a bit of a two for one, Ratio, and we'll have a look at them. We'll, we've looked at these hills, and there'll be a cliff, and we'll say, okay, let's stay away from the cliff because, as you said, if you're off on some of your assumptions, you don't want to be on the wrong side of the cliff. And to further support Brian, I mean, you know, the, the Monte Carlo simulation is sort of a yeah, junk in, junk out. So Monte Carlo is to measure and test uncertainty. So you know, if you've got junk numbers to start with, um, no matter how much Monte Carlo you do, it's going to be junk in, junk out. If you've got very good numbers going in, uh, Monte Carlo will just sort of give you that, you know, that, yeah, sort of that bubble of, okay, it's sort of in this region. So, you know, and again, you know, with, with Brian, it's a bit of that, um, I think a bit of mining intuition, knowing when you're looking at, okay, here is the flat hill, and we want to say, you know, you know, why I would look at it, okay, if I'm going to go on a flat hill, I'm going to operate more towards the free cash flow break even grade more than go the other way and kind of stay on the hill. And then, you know, if there's a hill on production rate, I'd probably want to go, um, you know, on the lower end of production rate rather than the higher end, because the higher end's got more risk of not achieving it. Where if you target the lower achievable one, then, then you've got, uh, I guess, capacity in what you go with saying, okay, well, we're gonna achieve this. If it's a million tons, we know we can achieve that. If you start pushing the boundaries of what you think your mind can do, then you set yourself up for risk of not, uh, you know, all the infrastructure and all the equipment you may not be able to achieve. So a long winded answer. Um, you know, I think we all three of us have had a shot at it and there's no clear answer to it, but uh, trying to get approximately right versus precisely wrong, I guess. Right. Um yeah, we're 15 minutes over already, so I'm, uh, I think I'm going to close it off. I think Scott uh, had a question about sunk cost and COG, so I'm just going to stop the recording here. So uh, if you want to stay on and discuss a little, I'm definitely always uh, happy to. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Scott's like like needling me with that one or not. It's probably we've had discussions about that in the past. But yeah, I mean, for those, yeah, you, you don't consider cut, you know, sunk costs in, you know, 
go forward decisions other than maybe you shouldn't have started the mine when you realise that, okay, we're never going to recover. But once they're sunk, you can't get them back and all you can do is look forward and all you can... If you've got a project that's sort of at the end of the day, it's never going to recover the sunk cost, all you can say is maybe we shouldn't have started and how do we not make that mistake again. But yeah, sunk costs are just that. They're done for, you can't do anything about it and all you can do is... Uh, uh, the only situation you can see where sunk costs would even come into it if you had, if you had uh, borrowed money um, and that was sort of on your books, the sort of interest you had to pay on some capital that you borrowed money for. But apart from that, you know, they're ignored. Oh, I think that's, that's a good last word. And uh, thanks again for, for your time. Really appreciate it. Good to see, see so many familiar faces again and kind of definitely brought me back to that internship because I think you showed me the, the Hill of Value approach five, five years ago. And it's kind of, uh, it's interesting to see that you're still advocating for it. It's still this uh, mental shift probably needs to happen. Yeah, a bit like Brian said, so as a, I'm a consultant now too. And then sometimes you're just doing really what the client wants and it's not always aligned with what you want to do. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you kind of got to bend a bit to what what the client is paying you and what their needs and deliverables are. Sounds good. Oh, all right. Saying that for the third time now. Thanks so much, Henry and uh, Chris. Awesome to have you. If anyone else here in the audience wants to give a talk, reach out to us, Ruth and Claire or myself, and happy to organize something. Next week, drones. <laughs>